Okay, I'm back with Kenji Gallo. This is Jamie Hope with Sign, Sealed, and Delivered. And we were just talking. We were in the thick of you wearing a wire um, against the mafia. Um, and so one of the things that was interesting to me is you said that you are no longer a criminal because you had this laundry list of things you couldn't do while wearing a wire. So basically you couldn't commit crimes while wearing a wire. And yet at the same time, if you're working for the mob, I'm assuming they're going to expect you to commit crimes. So what a catch 22 to be in explain how that looked. So like I, I turned in all the money that I made from gambling, from the bookmaking, I turned Mm -hmm. it in. Like I never profited from that. Um, <clears throat> other things like if the, they asked to give me money to loan out, I would just pay the interest on the money. I wouldn't actually loan it to anyone. Yep. So I wasn't I wasn't Shylocking anymore. I was just fake Shylocking. And um, when they would ask me to do things, I would just get out of it because I had done so many bad things in the past that no one doubted that I was capable of doing things. And so <laughs> I would just be like, hey, man, I got, you know, I got something else going on. And other things like when they, well, there's like a lot of things would come up. So people, um, people would give me guns, you know, mm-hmm. just give them to me because like, you know, I'm good for the money. And so yeah. I just turn, I would turn those into the feds and then I would, I would pay people for things like that out of, sometimes out of my own pocket because I just want, we want to keep the investigation going. So I would just pay. So if someone gave me like a couple of guns, I would just pay for them, but I actually turned them in. And now, what, wasn't there an incident, though, where you almost were involved, where they wanted you to help kill someone? Yeah. So, like, this is where it really came down really crazy. So, w- in Brooklyn, I was in Brooklyn, and, and I was with Teddy Persico Jr. and a guy named Eddie Garofolo. And uh, we were eating at a place called 101, and they were questioning me about a guy uh, named Craig, who's another made Colombo guy. But he was... He was on the opposite side. Columbus had a civil war in the 90s, and he had been part of the the other crew that tried to kill Teddy's dad, and Teddy didn't like him. So when they're asking me questions about him, Teddy's getting more and more worked up and about this guy, Georgie, who hung out with him. And so Teddy's like, come on, let's go. I'm going to take you home. And so I'm like, okay, because I had had walked over to this restaurant, and they're like, we're going to drive you home. And I'm like, okay. But I was sitting in the back, so I felt okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I was in any danger. (laughs) Don't don't sit in the front seat. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. There was no one behind me. (laughs) <laughs> so, so when I, I got out, they brought me to my house and I was just at my building and I just got out of the, the, of the car and I was walking. I was almost to the door and Teddy yells back, hey, get in the car. We're taking a ride. And those are like words that you really don't want to hear. <laughs> but I got in the car and my wire is rolling, by the way, too, through this whole thing. And we, I got in the car and he looks back and he goes, we're going to deal with this problem today. And I go right now. And he goes, yeah. And then we start driving and he turns the radio down, which I'm like, oh, good. Now the, the wire is rolling. You know, they can hear. Oh, everything. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm leaning towards him and I put my hand up there. It's in my watch. And I go and he said, you know, Craig is just like us. You know, he's with it, but he's with a different crew, meaning that he's a made guy. He's a Colombo guy like like Teddy. And he goes, but he's with a different crew. And he was a part of that other the other crew, meaning the war. And he goes, and we're going to deal with it. And we're going to deal with Georgie today. So, and then he looks at me and he goes, you got a problem with that? And I go, no. Inside you're dying. (laughs) Yeah. Because if I have a problem with it, believe me, I'm done. And I'm thinking in my mind, like, how am I going to get away? Can I make a call to the feds and tell them? Because this is like late in the afternoon and we go to. Are they, are they following you at all? Or is it, is it, they're not tracking you in real time necessarily. So it's not like they're hearing you and they're like, okay, we got to get Kenji out of there. They're, they're not present anywhere. No, and that's like that's like a falsehood that you see on TV all the time. There's no one behind you. There's you, you have no backup. No one knows where you are. Ooh, and that makes it worse. <laughs> and so we started driving. We went to Teddy's mom's house, and when we got there, it was so it was so weird and surreal because his mom's like asked me if I want some food. It's like a movie. It's like she wants some food here. Sit down, have some water. And Teddy's calling his brother, telling him to bring over the gear, bring over guns. And Eddie's like, I got to go to the bathroom. And then Teddy's mom showed me pictures from his first mother's day in 17 years. Cause he just got out of prison uh-huh. and I'm sitting there going, Oh, and so finally his brother gets there. We go outside and he has this box with guns in it. And I mean, it's pretty pitiful. I mean, oh. I'm telling you, Man, you must have just felt so freaked out inside. I I mean, (laughs) I would have melted. I was was like freaking out and I was looking at the guns going, man, this is pretty sad and I feel bad and this is going to end up bad. So they're taking out guns. Teddy gets a gun out. His brother has one. This other kid, Frankie, has one. And he looks at me and he goes, get one. 
and I look at the guns and there there's no bullets that fit the guns that were left. And he's like, can't you make them fit? And I go, no. Can't you make no. them fit? It doesn't work like that. And he's like, <laughs> he goes, well, just take one. I go, what do I need an empty gun for? What's the point? He goes, yeah. well, you got your knife on you? And I said, yeah. And he goes, okay, well, anyone run towards you, you take care of it. And I go, great. So yeah. now, we're, now we're rolling. And now I'm really I'm really worried because the FBI said, like, don't, don't take part in any violence. Like, what are mm-hmm. we going to do? So we're rolling towards the Brooklyn, this restaurant where he told the guy to meet. He tried to make the guy meet him close by his mom's house, but apparently they have killed someone there before. So the guy did not want to come there. He wanted to meet in public. Uh-huh. So... So Craig's like, I already parked my car at Valley. We're we're done at this restaurant. So he's like, okay, I'm gonna grab this kid. We're gonna t- I'm gonna take him by the water. And if anyone does anything, you you be over there. My brother's gonna be across the street. So we we start driving, and he's like, hey, you're being really quiet. Are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, don't worry about me. This is how I do things. Really, I'm just letting the tape run. So <laughs> and like recording everything. And so we we come up over this like little rise. And we, to where the restaurant is, and I'm not kidding you, there is a, a full uh, New York Fire Department hook and ladder, and a paramedic, and a and two cop cars, and a par- an ambulance, and they are wheeling a guy out of the restaurant next door. I am not kidding. And I'm thinking in my mind, the feds are really listening to me. And, <laughs> and then Teddy's like, he starts freaking out. He's like, we haven't even done anything yet, and they're already here. And he's like, okay. To me, he goes, go out and tell my brother that it's off, but I'm still going to go talk to this kid. And I go, okay. And he goes, go do it. So um, I'm looking for his brother. I can't see him. And then finally, I see his brother standing across the street from the restaurant with this guy, Frankie, and they got socks on their hands because they don't have they don't have gloves. They're, they have mm-hmm. sock. They have a sock on their hand. Why? And, because they're going to use that as a glove to hold the gun. And okay. I go, so I, I tell him, I run over there and I tell him it's off, it's off, it's off. And they're like, Hey, Teddy didn't tell us we don't, we're going to, we're going to do what we got to do. And I go, it's off. And so finally I see their other brother, Danny. And I go, I told him, I go, Hey, go over there and tell, you know, the kids that it's off. And they did. And then Teddy comes back to me. And he goes, look, Craig's pretty pissed off. I smoothed it over with him, but don't ever turn your back on him anymore. And I go, well, what's that mean? Yeah. And, and so, like, he's like, well, you know, he's a ki- he's a killer and he's probably not taking this good. And I'm like, well, dude, this is not good. And so after that, they just dropped me up at home. That ended that. But I recorded this whole thing. Like, it, it ended up being like a 13-hour tape. But from start to finish, it gave it gave the feds an excellent look into how they set up a hit and what they do. I cannot believe, man, someone must have seriously been looking out for you with that because, I mean, knowing where you're at now, spiritually and everything, it seems like, you know, God's like, uh, he'll get out of this because that is, that is like, that's, that is like a serious, like movie line. I mean, that is a scenario you see straight up in the movies. That is so crazy. And so, um, you got out of that, thankfully. And then how did your time end with? wearing a wire what did that look like well i went to i got called for a meeting into a restaurant by an older guy uh named manny who um i did business with and everything else and he brought he asked me to come to this diner i went to the diner and again bad thing they put they they guided me to a closed off section of this diner it's just and i and he starts yelling at me and he's like, did you tell Edward and Teddy that I, that I'm laundering money for you? And I go, no. And then he's like in, getting increasingly working himself up and getting, you know, more mad and more mad. I can see what he's doing. He's trying to, you know, to do something to me, but he's working himself up. And he says, and I'm like smirking because I'm thinking in my mind, hey, I could just play you back the wire and tell you. I didn't say anything like this. You're like, right, right. But, like, because I really didn't. And then he's working himself up and then he threatened me. Then he said, if, he goes, if you smirk one more time, I'm going to punch you in the face. And then, and then I go, and at this point I was tired of it. I'm tired of all these criminals. And I go, if you punch me, I go, I will knock you out and knock out all your teeth. That's it. <laughs> and I go, and and now the meetings, and he's like, starts screaming at me. Like you would do that. Cause that's like a, that's like a cardinal sin in that mm-hmm. world. I can't, I can't raise my hands to a made guy. And mm-hmm. I, I, I wasn't, I was just an associate and I go, yeah, I don't care. I'll I'll knock you out, get on a plane and leave tomorrow. I don't care. And so I go, this meeting's over. I'm out of here. So I went out. So he starts chasing after me and he's oh. trying to grab my arm. And I'm like, dude, don't touch me. I'm telling you, don't touch me. And so when I got out the door, I could see my car. And then there's an abandoned gas station across from this 
across from it. And right behind the abandoned gas station was the same two kids that were on the corner that were going to be shooters. And they were in a Honda, like not their car, like a, probably a stolen car. So and they I'm were like, setting you up? Yeah, they were setting me up. And I'm like, ah. So I, I at this point, you know, legally or not legally, I, already, I had a gun underneath the seat of my car. And all I could think of was to get to my truck and reach underneath there and grab it. Cause it's like, you know, it's pretty much mm-hmm. almost at, at shoulder level. Cause my truck was higher and all I, and I hit remote start. Cause everyone has a remote start where it's cold in <laughs> okay. New York. and I, I unlocked the doors and I'm just like, I got 20 steps. If I could just get that, I could put the car in between me and those two guys and Manny's behind me, but he's not going to be a problem. I'll take care of him. And so I just started walking briskly to the car. And then Manny disappeared, but then he drove his car in front of me and tried to pull me into his car. Like he had this Porsche, like one of those Porsche Cayennes, like the uh, SUV, and he tried to pull me in. And I, I grabbed him, I pushed him off, and then I made the step to my car and I grabbed the gun. And then I was like, okay, lock the door. And no <laughs> one stopped me. And I'm like, and, I, and like they're little cars. I go, I'm going to knock them right off the road. I'm going to get on the Belt Parkway. I got on the Belt Parkway and I headed to Manhattan. And I was like, that's it. I'm never going back. I don't care did what you the feds stri- Did you drive straight to the feds? <laughs> oh, I drove to Manhattan and then I just, and I, I told them what happened and they wanted me to still contact with them. But then Manny called me later that night and like started yelling at me again. And I just like, that's, I had it up to here. And I just told him that's it. I just cussed him out and told him like, what I do. And so for days and weeks after that, they were all trying to get a hold of me. Like I, I went immediately to Canada and they were trying to get find out where I was and drive up there supposedly. And I, of course, I'm not going to tell them. Where yeah. I'm at. Yeah. And yeah. I got, I got snowed in and then I never went back to Brooklyn. They, they, uh, people stole stuff from my house. They took one of my cars and they, and they blocked it in. They, the feds found it later at a, in somewhere else blocked in and um my other car was at the airport and i ended up getting that back and i had to get rid of that too but um that was it that was my last time and then you went into witness protection after that didn't you oh i spent many 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 months in limbo and yes i was in i was a protected witness and Mm -hmm. really there's no protection you just go to a safe house and uh and they tell you, the U.S. Marshals tell you, don't give us any trouble. This is your per diem, and we're going to come check on you. And at first, they check on you like once a week. Then it gets to be twice a week. Then it becomes once a month. Then it becomes once every other month. And this time, at this point, I have no car, no job, no identification that they know of. And uh, I'm just sitting around. And that's when I decided that I'm just going to start training and reading books and try to figure out what I'm going to do when I leave. And so and you I, left and so you left and you decided. And then at that point, did, did you go back to California? Well, no, I spent two years in limbo like that. Yeah. And then after that, where did you go? Well, right after that, I went to Spain. I went on a vacation because I had never been on a vacation before. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> hey, this good. and so I, I went to Spain and uh, I ended up staying there for like almost a little bit over a year. And uh, I, that's where I started writing Breakshot, and I was doing the uh, blog called Hollywood, where back then it was called, um, yeah, Hollywood Mafia. And uh, then then after that, I, I moved back to California, and I decided that I was going to write a book. I already wrote most of it in Spain. Mm-hmm. And um, that's it. That's pretty much how and I you just it. And now you just decide, to people, I'm sure there's a lot of people who might not know how this actually works. They're probably like, why is this guy living out in the open? willing to talk about this and is he not afraid like what you know I mean because for me and I'm sure most people like you know love them or hate them they have a profound respect for the mafia as far as you know what they can do to you so what do you say to people who are wondering how you just live your life like this well I left the witness protection program I signed out left just left don't care Mm -hmm. um Damage is already done. They can't do anything. It takes a lot of a lot of money and a lot of people to kill somebody in real life. They don't really come blazing into places with machine guns. That's all movie stuff. If everyone actually looked at the news, they would see that. Um, really, what are they going to do? I'm the same yeah. same guy I was before. I'm just not like as bad as I was, but I'm going to protect myself and my family. Sure. And I'm not living in fear. And if I live in fear, they're still going to control me. Mm-hmm. That's so, true. And And now a big part of that, too, is shortly, not shortly, but a while after you, um, a while after you did that, you 
somehow gave your life over to Christ. And so now for someone that lived in the darkness like you did, I mean, my gosh, you're running with Mexican drug cartels. You're running with the mafia. You're in the porn industry. You're, you've got the feds bring it, breathing down your neck your whole life. You're in and out of prison. I mean, that is a profound life on the edge. How did you go from that to now of faith in Christ? That's just amazing. Well, what happened with me is I was always around. I was a Christian before I was brought up a Christian and, and uh, I used to go to Lutheran school, in fact. And um, what happened is I just strayed away. And when I was like in trouble all the time, like, they, you know, the chaplains would come to you when you're locked up and say, like, hey, you know, you, you ever thought about Jesus? And I would be like, yeah, whatever, whatever. But they give me a Bible and I can read. The thing is, the, the Bible, you can bring it with you to go to court and stuff and you could read it because they can't take away a, that, a, a religious book. So I would just read it, but I didn't, it didn't register with me. It just was like a book and then just something to kill the time. And then later on, after I got out of trouble, like people would always ask me and then I would say, no, 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 I'm just going to live my life, but be a good person. <laughs> and, you know, and then like, I noticed that always, even after I was out of trouble, like you, I'm always missing something. Cause basically what I was doing is I was still the same kind of person, not committing crimes, but just caring about money. <laughs> and it finally, it just, one day, like a couple of my clients, I was, I was training guys in Hollywood and I was writing and a couple of them, like one guy asked me for my address and I gave it to him and he sent me a Bible. I mean, mm -hmm. just out of the wow. blue. And then another guy, another actor, well-known guy took me out to lunch and he goes, you know, you're a spiritual guy. And then he just, and I was like, oh no, he trapped me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he's going to like, he's going to beat this down. And I'm like, but I was like, I should just leave. But he's such a nice guy that I was like, okay, I'll just, you know, it's just a lunch. Mm -hmm. But he only told me the story about himself and then never brought it up. So it was like a five minute conversation and only about him. He just wanted to plant a seed. Yeah. And so like right after that, I told my wife, we had just gotten married. I said, and she, and she was a Christian and her parents were missionaries and, and, uh, she had fallen away and I just told her, I think I want to go to church. And so we looked for a church and we found one and we went and I remember just going to this church and it, I was so scared that my knees were shaking. Like this is like this. I went through that whole thing where we're going to go kill somebody and I might get killed. And I wasn't even scared. The pit of my stomach hurt. I thought everyone's going to know that I'm a fraud, that I haven't been here forever. And once we started singing, it all started coming back to me and it was like, boom, like all that emptiness that I had inside, everything else before was gone. And it just opened my eyes. And I realized like, wow, what an idiot I've been all this time. And that's it. That was six years ago. And that is, that's amazing because a lot of people who say, you know, oh, religion is just some, but something that people use as a crutch. And for someone like you that lived in such stark contrast to that, like, like you said, to say I'm living as a good person, well, who who good to who like good can be relative you know one person might think something's good another culture might think something's completely normal and that's good and it might not be acceptable here so if you want to say play that game of i'm gonna live a good life well according to who yep where's well, the moral authority of what's good and not and like here's what people can say like i never use it as a crutch i never used it as to get out of trouble in fact, mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't like those guys that every time they get in trouble, they're like, oh, I found the Lord and all this stuff. I looked <laughs> at them like frauds. Like I used to be like, eh, I don't want to be like that kind of con, mm -hmm. like that kind of convict, you know? Yeah. And so I was in no trouble, nothing except for spiritual trouble. Like I was empty inside because I had nothing. You, We all tend to think, especially here in the United States and now with everything new, all these younger generations, they think like, I'll just be a good person, you know, karma. They always say karma, but they don't even yeah. know what it is. Right. And it's like, you have to have something greater than yourself. And you, and once you understand that it's not up to you, mm -hmm. like it, your choice is up to you, but you need something else. You need a moral authority. You need yeah. rules in life and you yeah. have to live by them. That's when you know that, like I knew things came together for me mm -hmm. and being a Christian and, and Jesus, it's like, it changed my whole life. Mine too. Mine too. I mean, I mean, I was raised Catholic, but I mean, I, I was definitely not even anywhere near what you were. But like, I mean, I got into a lot of trouble. I was a little bit of a hoodlum back in the day myself. And um, 
you know, I believed, I always knew there was a God, but like, I definitely was not living for that. But I can tell you what, like when I did become a Christian follower of Christ relationship with him, like, yeah, it, it, it's not just like behavior modification. There's like really kind of a supernatural feeling there, like presence, like it's, it's unexplainable. So people that think you're just looking at the Bible and, you know, becoming a Bible thumper and using it as a crutch, it's like, no, there's actually something really supernatural about the whole situation. And I have been, we, me and my family, we have been through like a lot of things that could have broken a lot of people. And I, it, it was profoundly helpful and, um, you know, to be able to go through those things with having God there. I can't even describe, I could tell people things that happened miraculously that they would be like, Oh, no way that never happened. You're lying, but they did, you know? So, I mean, I agree with you. It's like, you know, it's not a behavior modification program, you know, it's a relationship, but so then you, so now you're living out in the open, you're married, you're living life with Christ. You had a great book. And for people who just heard Kenji tell his story, you still need to read his book because there's so much more in there than, I mean, you will read his book and just be like, Oh my gosh, when you see all of the details play out. So make sure, and I'll put it up to make sure you get his book. This is a great time to read it, but you wrote this book. So this to me seems like a really good setup for um, some kind of a movie. So why has this not been turned into one yet? Because the book is phenomenal. <laughs> this is a well, real life gangster story. <laughs> well, I have gone through, you know, it's been optioned. It's been bought. We've uh, wrote screenplays for Fox, um, a couple other companies. I mean, it's been, it's been through the whole Hollywood thing. And before but that, I remember Fox, they first told me, you know, we got to talk to you about the lead character. And I'm like, what? And they're like, you know, that he's Asian. I'm like, oh, really? You mean <laughs> out, out of the world? Out of one out of every four people in the world is Asian. Right. But you can't, you can't find one that can play me. And they said, <laughs> oh, well, you know, we just, we got to be able to be able to sell it. And I'm like, oh yeah, sure. So they, I'm like, why don't you just get like Justin Bieber or Zac Efron to play me? And they're like, oh, that's a good idea. So <laughs> I can, I can already see where this was going. And then other people in Hollywood, a lot of people just don't read and they want, they have their assistant read and they don't take the time to learn the material and they want to do the same. All the screenplays that were written off my book were just horrible and terrible. I'm embarrassed of by them. Mm-hmm. Um, even though they're written by Academy Award winning guys with me, uh, they were just terrible because they want to do the same old cliche stuff and they didn't want to hear they like they used to have me as consultant and they didn't want to hear it. i'm like why do you guys even pay me if you don't want to hear how it really is right right so because in, in hollywood you have a bunch of fanboys basically and, and girls mm-hmm. fan girls, but mostly you know boys mm-hmm. and they have they have this idea and they're like oh like i used to go to these meetings all the time they would say like Oh, like, what do you think of the Sopranos? Don't you think that's so realistic? It's so realistic, right? I go, I don't know. Were you in a mob crew before? And they're like, what? <laughs> and then they're I'm like, how is that realistic? And they're like, well, isn't it realistic? And I go, no, not at all. Not, not wow. a little bit. Wait, so, like, so back up real quick. They didn't want to, they had a hard time putting your story into a movie because you're Asian. And this is coming from the same people who preach about racism all the time. Oh, Clearly, like this. What, the, look at look at all their movies. You just recently are you even even seeing any Asian Asian people carrying movies? Even look at just look at Hawaii Five O. Okay, you reboot a a series and everybody in the poster, they're all white people. In the uh, way in the back, you got one Asian guy, Daniel Day Kim. <laughs> you know, it's like okay. you know, you're it's it's about Hawaii. Mm-hmm. It's right, it's all, in Hawaii, and there's a bunch, all, and it's all white people, yeah. right? Right. And this is all they do. They, they, they do like I used to go to these diversity meetings for the WGA Writers Guild of America. Mm-hmm. And it's all, it would be like me, this other Asian guy who I know, like no, like one Latin, uh, maybe a couple African-Americans and the rest of them were like all white women. And I would say, well, why are they all here? And they're like, oh, because they're minorities too. And I'm like, oh yeah, where'd they go? Princeton, Brown, Duke. And then that's what I would get. And I, and I would say like this, and, and this is it. That's all they do is they just give it lip service. And it's, it's like a joke. They only care about, and people probably get mad at me for saying this, but they only care about like, when they say you're racist, they only care about one culture. That's mm-hmm. it. Yeah. African-American. If you don't, it doesn't matter if you're like this. I used to always say, yeah, where's the Asian American entertainment channel? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wait, you don't have, where's the Asian history month? Oh, we don't have one. And then I go, all you do is make movies about 
slavery, but like, hey, my dad was in a, a Japanese American prison camp with, yeah. his, with his family, and they're um, they're American citizens, and that mm-hmm. was like they're still alive. This is like in this is in this you know in this century back those then. Those internment camps, you never yeah. ever see movies about those ever ever. And what people don't realize about that, you know, there's a lot of people that might even be watching that didn't know during World War II, we put a lot of Japanese people, friends of my grandparents, got, one of them got put in there and they take your property and everything and they never gave it back. Oh, they lost, my, my family lost everything. They were allowed to carry two suitcases for the whole family. So mom, my grandma and grandpa, my dad and his sister were allowed to take two suitcases. My uncle George uh, was ended up going to prison because he didn't go to camp. And both my dad and uncle George were released to fight in the army. So they couldn't be trusted to be on the street right. but, and they couldn't have any property, but they were okay to go to Europe to fight. So, and this is, but this is, and no one ever talks about that. And then it didn't end, just end after World War II. It kept on going. You could look it up. It's the Asian, Asian land acts. They weren't even allowed to buy land until the wow. 1960s. And, and this is, and this is something, yeah. And again, this is something that, like you said, I mean, you know, it seems like it's always black and white issues, but you guys are getting got left out and you guys got railed pretty hard there too yourselves. And now Hollywood, they don't even, <clears throat> like you said, I mean, for them to say to you, oh, we don't know if we can find an Asian to play you like that. <laughs> what? And you would think with a story, with a story like yours, how unique is that? You were an Asian involved in the mafia and drug cartels. I mean, come on, like that just seems to me like a gold mine right there. But I mean, That's what I, said. I said, you're taking away the hook of the story. The yeah, thing that right. it's not like a mob story is the fact that it's, look at me. Do I right. belong? Oh, clearly. So yeah, right. that's, that's, that was my thing. But they're just interested. They're interested in telling their own story and their own agenda with the same guns and the same stupid suits that these people wear. And they don't want to change it. Right. And, and then, so then we obviously get the same, um, movie different variations but they're all kind of the same i mean we have casino we have goodfellas we have godfather i mean they just came out with an irishman um you know you have sopranos and all that but you really knew some of these guys you knew henry hill right yeah i knew him afterwards like after crime and like funny thing is henry henry got to be like we did a couple things and then he got to be he was just like a real drunk and i remember he sent me this one facebook message called me a rat piece of crap and all these names and i saved it because i'm like well that's pretty funny that henry hill would call me that you know right and and then even like henry i would like back then i was still like you know the mean guy i just told henry i go wait till i see you again (laughs) well didn't he do the same thing yeah, of course he did. He was worse than me. He's just like he, he's just like he was just calling me like I don't know, drunk one day, high on something, and started writing all these things. And so that's it. it. But like yeah, he was he was projecting probably, huh? Yeah, and then yeah, I know I know a lot of guys, a lot of the people that this stuff it's like um, you know I'm friends like if you watch the movie Casino, my friend uh, his father and uncle are the ones that killed uh, the Joe Pesci character. And, really. And, and, real they really killed him and they didn't do it like the way that was in the movie um you know i knew the guys in the casino i know the guy at the casino one of the guys that went really and they, they killed a guy in the pool house and his wife like i know those those guys and really you know the real guys from donnie brasco some of the guys that were in that crew wow, in the, in the sunny black way too. and um i knew other guys that were involved in the uh and you know like with the lucchese family and paul vario's crew and i knew people uh involved in like almost every every one of those things actually what do so. you think they think about all these movies that are out about them i've talked to them about it they oh like, you have when I was, when we were on the street yeah yeah we, they used to just laugh maybe like oh they never got that right and like secretly they would like it though because you can't you in the in the mob and when you're in that life you don't tell people like hey i'm a mobster right they right. have to figure they had to figure it out like for themselves but mm-hmm. this is like advertisement for them <laughs> Yeah, you know, for real. Like, so I used to go, like, I used to go to guys' offices all the time, and then I'd see, like, the they they'd tell me how much they hated, like, this guy Anthony Fiato because he wrote a book called The Animal in Hollywood. And then I would go to all these porn guys' places because, and they're all mentioned in the book, and they'd all have the book behind their desk. <laughs> how and, how and, accurate how accurate are these movies? Not it, not really accurate at all the, the most accurate one the one that and it's so old now even it, the times are so past is donnie brasco mm-hmm. with john depp is probably yep. the the best one and the closest to reality as it was at that point um those that's really how those guys are but, i mean like al pacino like 
I'm not a big fan of his anymore, but man, in that movie, he nailed the way Lefty is and those guys are. them giving you money and taking it back and like and, and then asking <laughs> you for money all the time. Oh, this is that is the life. Really? Wow, that's crazy. When they're breaking open the parking meters like that, like sure. yeah. um which oh glamour of of the mafia life for real, huh? I mean, you, we we have a fascination with these movies. Why do you think everybody's so fascinated with these movies? Because people like the idea of living outside the law and being able to get revenge, like you know, get like I don't like, and that's it's the truth is because I never did have to like lawsuit somebody or somebody with more money than me could say whatever they want. They could say to me, you know, I'm going to sue you, do this, and I'd be like, okay, go ahead, because you're going to get nothing. I have nothing, and in the end you're going to get hit in the head with a piece of rebar. And that would be the end of it. Because really, life, like that kind of life, that, what people don't realize is that mobsters don't do anything to innocent people. If, if if your business gets taken over by them or if you're involved with them, it's most likely mm-hmm. the guy wanted to be friends with them and like tried to be friends with them and they, they, they got in that way. Yeah. It, it's like they don't just pick random people off the ground. Like if you like if you want to lay down with dogs, you're going to get fleas. And that's mm-hmm. that's really the, that's like the, the, the brunt of that. You know, um, one of my grandparents one time, um, they were in a city these people and um I guess he was no you know he people respected him like my granddad I mean you know one time he got his hubcap stolen off his car and he one of the people knew he was a made man and I don't it's, I don't remember if it was one I think it was one of the higher ups in in their organization and he saw that my granddad had his hub, hubcap stolen he's like hey those back for you my granddad was like yeah no I'm okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> like he's a favor you do me a favor <laughs> right there's there's nothing for free and and like you don't want to take it and like people let these people in and then that's what happens mm-hmm. but i guess what, what the thought was behind it like yeah no like i don't want you to get my hub cats right because i don't want to owe you a favor so is that what is that really how they would do it though yeah yeah I'm, i would do favors for people all the time and then i would then i would say hey Remember when you, when uh, I did something for you? Right. So that is, is that would you say that's a more a more part more truthful part of the movies? A lot of times you see businesses from, from people that are not in businesses are people but really what probably happened was they did a favor for them and then they owed them. Is that how they kind of set it up? Yeah. They try to get in with you like this. Hey, you need something. You need some help. And then they, when you come back, you're like, Hey, remember that time I did this for you? Now I need yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought that that was probably a true part of the story. So, which is the least? Which ones are the the movies or shows that you hate the most? Like, which ones are you just like, Come on, man, that's just so ridiculous. Well, I, I don't really watch many of those anymore because I just can't watch them. I can't watch like <laughs> constant crime movies where they just have unlimited bullets and they fire guns and they all carry guns. Like, first of all, <laughs> we, ne- we never carry guns. You only come dressed. That's what they call a dress or bring your cousin with you or whatever. Or uh, if you're going to do work, which means that you're going to rob something or kill someone or shoot someone. That's it. Other than that, it's it's actually a it's it's a huge it's like a huge no-no to wear a, a gun to a meeting or something like that. They they don't want you to have it. It's not it's not a toy. It's not meant to be shown and carried around because otherwise it has your DNA fingerprints on it. What good is it? And yeah. So Hollywood shows all these people like machine guns and these expensive pistols. Well, once you shoot it once, you got to throw it away. So what was the point of having that thousand dollar Glock? You know. Yeah. Or whatever. What's the point? And then they they ask me in Hollywood, well, what would you carry? I go, I don't know. Something I get for fifty bucks, a hundred bucks. And they're like, why? And I go, because if I can't kill you in six or eight shots, what's the point? <laughs> I'm going right. to throw it away. I'm going to throw it away anyway. It's got to mm-hmm. be crushed, burned, slapped, d- d- destroyed. I got to make it disappear. So what mm-hmm. do I Why do I want something real fancy for? I got to throw it away. So right. go ahead. Go ahead. They, they, that's it. They didn't like that. Are there any other things that you see in, in these movies that you're that you think are just so off? I mean, obviously, that's a big one, but I didn't know if there's anything you could think of offhand that you're like, really? Yeah, no. <laughs> the, the fact that they have these guys in suits going out to collect money and stuff, we're suit and tie. Look, 
John Gotti dressed like that. And believe me, he was pretty much the end of that. Um, but he didn't do it when he's going to do work. And all the other guys like, yeah, when I was a kid in the 70s, I used to have to wear a suit to get on the airplane. OK, we wore a suit everywhere. When I went up to dinner, my dad wore a suit to, to work. It's not like that anymore. America doesn't do that. We just wear we wear jeans and T-shirts and that's how everyone dresses. And they had rules like even when I was there, no like shiny suits, no gold Rolexes, no big gold crosses with diamonds, no big diamond pinky rings. All that stuff was no way. So when I see someone dressed like that, I'm like, oh, what a poser. <laughs> you can point them out that they're actually not one because of how they're dressed. Yeah. Like I've had guys come to me and like pretend like they're kind of being the lobster. And I was like, wow. That's a nice Rolex, a nice ring. I could probably take that and get like 30 grand for it. And that's how a real mobster thinks. They're like, wow, I could just take that from him. Wow. <laughs> did you, what did you think of um, The Godfather? Did you see The Godfather? Of course, many times. Okay. Um, I liked it as a drama and as a movie. It's probably one of the better movies, well written. Um, great family drama has all the tension there, you know, between brothers and like the guy trying to get out. I mean, it's just it's just great. Great for the time period. I wasn't around the mob like in the 40s and 50s, but mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a great, great all around good. What about Casino? Um, since I knew some of those people. Uh, I mean, it, it was good too, but then it's still, it's still Martin Scorsese uses the same cast. I mean, mm -hmm. I would think yeah. like, come on, man, use someone different. It's mm -hmm. just like the continuation of Goodfellas. Other than that, it was, it was, it was decent and, uh, you know, pretty good. They got a lot of the facts wrong, which is amazing because the people were actually around that did it. Real. And did they talk to them? Were they actually? No, they used some people that, uh, a couple guys that aren't so truthful. Gotcha. And, and. Was it unnerving knowing that, I mean, maybe not for you because of your mindset, but I mean, knowing that there were psychos like that, that would actually, you know, just kill people like that. I mean, was that, did that not register to you at the time? No, <laughs> were I you mean, ever on edge at all? No, I mean, like there's some guys and there, there's some guys in the life that are so violent that no one wants to be around them. Really? They're just about, not, they're just about, not good. What about Sammy the Bull Gravano? I did not know him. You know, did not. He's in a different family than me. I mean, I knew lots of people that knew him and I was around a lot of people. But, yeah, just not my, you know, not my era, not my time. Yeah. And then um, what do you think of Robert De Niro? Dude, like he used to make good movies mm -hmm. and now he's just a, a character of himself. <laughs> and he just like on and on about everything. I don't know what it is with all these guys like they and, and women they meet they meet like some kind of success financial or, or 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 both and like you know they get they get in the public eye and then they have to tell us how to live all the mm -hmm. time. It's like dude, look at yourself first and then tell us. But like I don't understand like this like you Michael Bloomberg, you get like billions of dollars and then you have to tell us how we have to live, what we have to do. Oh, but I I have armed guards because I'm I'm good. I'm an important person. Yeah. But you can't have a gun. Uh, and and uh, you need to like do all this. But I can fly around in my private jet every weekend back to New York or to my private island in the Bahamas. Right. Yeah. Like I don't understand. Like that's where Robert De Niro is. Like he lost me as a fan because like I don't care what he thinks. Right. And I'm, I'm, I'm tired of him cussing and everything else and telling me like how I don't do this and how I don't do that. But yet he they could just hop on private planes or private yachts and go wherever they want. But I'm using too much carbon. Right. Exactly. It just seems like they're projecting when they do that, doesn't it? Like they're yeah. like they're trying to project and deflect, you know, like, OK, I'm going to sit there and talk about what everybody else is doing so that they're not paying attention to me. When if they had half a brain cell, they would realize that they're actually putting more attention on themselves and they're subjecting themselves to more scrutiny by trying to tell other people how to live. Like, how's that working for you, genius? You know, so right. you, all, all you need to do is look how they all turn out. Mm hmm. Exactly. Let's look, Harvey, let's look at Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> yeah, right. Honestly, I feel like there is definitely going to be a reckoning with some of this stuff. And my thought is maybe some of these people are doing things that they know they shouldn't be doing. And they probably know that their time might be short. So they're like acting out in really weird ways. That's just my thought. But I guess we'll see what happens, huh? <laughs> yeah, time will tell. In, in my experience, what goes around comes around. That is so <laughs> true. I, I, I think you're right there. And um, now and now just to wrap up, um, I'll, I'll let you get going here. And I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. I might have to have you come on some other time and just talk because you're a fascinating person. But you're what are you doing now? 
uh, well, right now I'm on lockdown like everyone else. <laughs> when you're not on I'm lockdown. A, I'm, I'm on shelter in place. But, uh, you know, I mean, right now I, I'm, I wrote another book. I, I still write. I put mm-hmm. out stuff and uh, I own a gym. Um, I do I do uh, boxing training and private training. And uh, that's about it. Uh, and- I, I do Parkinson's program. I teach park- boxing for Parkinson's called Rock Steady Boxing. So... Nice. And with your writing, you actually, I think you, besides, even besides your book um, and optioning that, you've written some other things that have been picked up, haven't you? Yeah. I sold, I sold three screenplays. Um, I sold this thing to History Channel called The Gunfighter. They're, you know, they're probably never going to make them, but they bought them and I was paid. That's great. Hey, yeah. that's great. Give me money. <laughs> yeah. I wrote, I wrote a second book. It's just, I'm, I'm, now that I have time, I'll be finishing editing it this next couple weeks. And uh, Fiction or sorry. nonfiction? No, it's a it's it's nonfiction. It's about my life and about coming to Christ afterwards and everything that happened since I left. That's great. And you know, me, hey, maybe God was just waiting for you to write that to actually get your movie made so that that can you know encompass that part of your life too. You know, so that, that's maybe, what I do. Maybe. Well, we'll have to we'll have to try to make a concerted effort to you know rally people to say make Kenji's movie because I mean that's a really that would make a really good movie. I mean, and again, everybody should read Break Shot right? That's the book break shot. Well, th- this, yeah. And that's why I want it now that I have the second book and I wanted to like every time I've, I've even talked to people about break shot, like other movie companies since then mm-hmm. studios, I've told them that I want it to be the Christian part of the end. And of course, none of them like that. Oh, of course not. But you know, no. I mean, there are a lot of, um, if they would see now, obviously Christian movies are, um, becoming very popular and this could be more, this to me, is completely mainstream. It most certainly wouldn't be PG or PG 13, but you know, there's some people I know, obviously I'm a screenwriter too. I'll have to, I'll have to put you on their radar because they're people that are well known. And, um, I think that they're looking, they're always looking for good movies. And I mean, yours would be perfect for that. And, and I think that they would be okay making an Asian character, the main character. Yeah. <laughs> it's so crazy to me. Really? I just can't believe that. Hollywood, you got a lot of work to do. Don't talk to us about our stuff until you fix your own mess. So, <laughs> but well, thanks for coming on the show right. and it would be great to have you on some other sometime. And I'm sure we'll be in contact. I always see you on yep. Facebook and you always have these great inspirational posts. I mean, you know, you are definitely someone that is a very, very rare, a rare breed. So <laughs> Thank you. I will be back on. So. And that would be great, Kenji. Uh, and right. everybody, everybody who's listening, this is Jamie Hope, Sign Seal Delivered. Please don't forget to like, subscribe so that you can see upcoming things. Thank you. Thank you.